want to invite uh, Pastor Gary Gibbs to come forward. Uh, Pastor Gibbs is from the Chesapeake Conference, uh, newly appointed evangelism director. We're glad to have you here at our church, Gary. And I know that New Hope has been going through a lot of transitions recently, and you have a, a special announcement to share with us. Well, I do. It's good to be here with you. And with your transition, the conference office has been working with your leadership in the senior pastor search, which continues on. But during this transition, everybody felt it'd be good to bring in a interim pastor. And so it's my privilege today to introduce him to you. And I'm looking around for him, starting to get nervous. <laughs> he's backstage, so he's going to make a dramatic entrance. Uh, pastor Gary Patterson has a broad experience in church ministry, and you have a bio in your, your worship bulletin today. And I met Gary and Ray, and by the way, Ray couldn't be here today because of a previous appointment, but I met them in Bulgaria many years ago. And it was a great celebration because we were dedicating a, a new church in a gypsy village that had just miracle stories surrounding it. But what I remember about Gary and Ray is just sitting around and talking, first time I met them, and just laughing. If you, do you like to laugh? Yeah, I love to laugh. And just hearing some great stories and laughing, I still remember them. I was embellishing one, and I was asking Gary about the details so I could tell it more uh, correctly, but I'll, I'll let him tell that to you later. But Gary's been a pastor, an evangelist, a church administrator. He's worked for North American Division, the General Conference. And right now in retirement, you can see his heart because he's still involved in ministry, doing interim pastorates, leading God's people closer to Jesus. And so I want to welcome Pastor Gary Patterson. Why don't you put your hands together and give him a big welcome as he comes. Good to see you. Good to have you here. And we appreciate you dedicating, you and Ray, dedicating your time, your energy, your experience to come here and to help lead out in the New Hope Church, uh, especially during this interim. And we want to have prayer for you. And I wonder if we could have the leaders of the church come up. And let's pray for Gary and Ray. And as I said, she couldn't be here today. But let's remember her in prayer as well as they come here to minister and to share together with you uh, Jesus' love. So we want the lay pastors as well. Who, who else do we want? The church executive committee members. So if you're part of any of those groups, come, come right up. Let's pray together for, for Gary. Gary lives in, uh, you're in Luray, Virginia, right? Luray. <laughs> Luray's the other place. Since you're not a native, that's all right. <laughs> Neither am I, by the way. Well, they taught you how to say it. Well, let's have prayer together. Let's gather around. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your wonderful love for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, it's in his name that we gather around Gary now, and we pray for him, Lord. I know that he's here because he loves you, and it's evident in his ministry that he wants to continue to bring people to the foot of the cross, to introduce them to your love. So bless him in his ministry here as he arrives here with a heart filled with ministry. We just pray, Father, that you'll pour out your Holy Spirit upon him the team that's surrounding here, him and this church, as they continue to lift high the cross, as they continue to minister to their community and to this church. May your Holy Spirit bless this team, Father, so that your light will continue to shine brightly here. We thank you that you'll do this because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At the outset, <clears throat> let me ask, does, does anyone happen to have a spare blood pressure meter with you today? 
It's, it's, been, a, it's been a fingernails on the blackboard trip. Uh, a little background. And by the way, today we're just going to get acquainted. No great theological tomes, no magnificent doctrinal insights. Uh, we just need to get acquainted. And I, as I look out over the audience, I see many that I know that I have worked with uh, previously, other locations, uh, General Conference, North American Division. Anne and I are doing a replay. Uh, she was serving as associate pastor in Marietta, Georgia, when I did an interim there. Uh, well, that was actually clear back in the last millennium. I mean... How long ago was that? Was that eight years ago? Eight years ago. So looking forward to that uh, time to share again with Anne and the staff, whom are we're just uh, getting acquainted. And, uh, tremendous staff that you have here. But I would I would like to say one thing here at the outset, as I tell you some various stories. Uh, well, first of all, what happened this morning? I figured I could get here in less than two and a half hours from my house. You see, this, this past week, my wife and I have been spending time with our two children and their families, our six grandchildren, at Smith Mountain Lake at my daughter's condo uh, at Smith Mountain Lake down in Virginia. I don't know if you've ever been to Smith Mountain Lake, anybody? Okay, well, some of you know where it is. Uh, down by Roanoke, down in the middle southern portion of Virginia, uh, which is about three hours from my house and then about two and a half hours here. Uh, that's why she's not with me here today, because she is still there with the family this last hurrah before school starts. My son and his family are up from Florida, where he's pastor of the Forest Lake Church, and my daughter and son-in-law and two grand their two grandsons who are just ready to head off, my two grandsons, their sons just ready to head off to Southern Adventist University for their senior year. And uh, the four kids from Florida are just starting school next Wednesday. So you know how that is. This is the last big shot for the family. I just wanted to point that out to put a little bit of guilt feeling on you that I'm here today. I, uh, you're not going to get off scot-free. But uh, we have been looking forward to this, and uh, my wife, Ray, is very disappointed that she can't be here with me today, but she will be as we continue on. So that's that's the basis. Last night, uh, well, I figured uh, five and a half hours was a little too much for a trip this morning. So I drove home last night, and I thought, okay, two and a half hours, leave at 7.30, I can beat 10 o'clock. Except for one thing. I know better than to trust the Beltway. I spent one hour between Highway 66 and the Dulles ex exit watching all the wonderful signs to Tyson's Corner. <laughs> My wife loves to go to Tyson's Corner. I would just as soon stay away from there anyway. But a whole hour passing Tyson's Corner. You know, I, when I first ran into the traffic, getting on the off-ramp off 66 onto 495. I said, man, it's a little crowded here. They're doing construction. You know, five, ten minutes, I can, I can afford that. It's not going to hurt anything. Thirty minutes later, I start digging out my cell phone, which probably was illegal to use, but we weren't moving anywhere anyway, trying to call Ann, trying to call Kumar, trying to call the church office, can't get anybody leaving desperate messages. I'm stuck in traffic. I'm still coming. I don't know how long I'll be, not knowing it was going to be a full hour. So anyway, I said to myself, they'll get started. They'll do fine. They will all be comfortable and happy and not upset and tense at all because they won't even know. But after telling myself all of that, I bit off all my fingernails. Uh, very frustrating. But here we are together. Now, a little bit, a little bit more about getting started together here today. Uh, 
a, a story that uh, Elder Bradford used to tell when he and I were working together in the North American Division office several years ago. <clears throat> it was one of my favorites. A man that was with the redeemed. They, they had reached the pearly gates and they were gathered together for great celebration. A man who had experienced the Jonestown flood. Now you'll understand in a minute why I'm telling you this story. Who supposedly went to the Lord and said, I want to speak to the redeemed host. I want to tell them about the experience of going through the Jonestown flood. And the Lord was kind to him and put him off a little bit. He said, well, maybe sometime, maybe, maybe later. But the man was insistent. And he kept coming back every time the redeemed host gathered together. He said, Lord, I want to tell them about the experience of the Jonestown flood. So finally, after time had gone by, and what is time in the new earth anyway? The Lord said, all right, next gathering you can tell them about the Jonestown flood. But I want you to remember one thing. And he said, what's that? He said, Noah will be in the audience. Now, where is David, by the way? I saw him earlier. I feel like the man speaking to the redeemed host, telling about the Jonestown flood when David Newman is still here. Where are you, David? Oh, there you are. There you are. And your lovely wife. Uh, let, me just, let me just say, may, maybe you can remember something, David, that, that I can't. I can't even remember when we first met. It's been so long that we have been colleagues, I don't even recall when that was. It just seems like we've known each other forever. Do you happen to remember? Now, it was before Pennsylvania, but I'm going to tell about that. But first, let me say this. I have had great admiration for David for so many years I can't even remember when. Superb biblical insight. Excellent writing skills. Great communicator. Delightful friendship. And all of these things, uh, I come here and I say, what am I doing here when David's here? But it's time for him to have a break. It's time for him to move on to some new things. But all of these great skills that he has, uh, intellectually, uh, communicative, all of that kind of thing, there is one thing I suspect that you do not know. And that is that he is a superb athlete. Superb athlete. And here's how I discovered this. I was serving as president of the Pennsylvania Conference, and David was speaking for us at our minister, ministerial gathering, uh, did a magnificent job of that. But one of the events of that meeting was a golf tournament. Uh, I, I can't remember. I, I think maybe we were playing in a scramble where we, I can't recall exactly what the format was, uh, where everyone uses the best shot and that kind of thing. But, but anyway, we had gotten around to about the 13th hole, and this was David's second, your second time out golfing, as I remember what you told me. Second time out. Well, he got up on the tee on the 13th hole, which was a par 3, for those of you who understand golf talk. And another pastor and I were discussing something, had our, our backs turned to him, at the back of the tee, and he was back there hitting the ball, <clears throat> and we heard him hit, and we turned around, and I said, uh, where did it go, David? And in his beautiful accent, he says, I believe it fell in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, 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 
this is your second time out. No, 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 that didn't happen. It just, oh, yes, it struck the front of the green and rolled along and fell in the hole. And, and we said, no, it must have rolled off the back. You know, he, no, no, that wouldn't have happened. So we walk up there, and we look, and what do you suppose? It was in the hole. <laughs> An eighth, a hole in one. <laughs> Interesting sequel to that story, I was playing golf with the same pastor the next spring, and I made a hole in one about six months or so later. He said, okay, next time out is my turn. I said, no, next time out it's whoever is with you's turn. I said, you're a carrier. That's what it is. David, I greatly respect and appreciate what you've done here with this congregation and wish you the best as you move on to new challenges and opportunities. I have experienced the retirement bit and gone on to do things I never imagined. And I pray that God will give you that same gift. We will enjoy your fellowship, but constantly remember that Noah is in the audience. But let me tell you about spare tires. It was a few years after the time together with Ann at Marietta, I was serving as interim senior pastor at the Atlanta North Church. And by the way, I'm not accustomed to timing here yet, and I got here so late I haven't even had a chance to look. What time am I supposed to be done? What is your normal quitting time? Oh, well, but we've got another service coming up. By 12, well, we'll beat that. I was doing an interim senior pastor role at the Atlanta North Church a few years after Ann and I had worked together. And it was my birthday. If I remember correctly, I'm thinking it was my 70th birthday. Yeah, it was okay. Let's not kid around. All right, I'm 74. <laughs> if I'm still with you on October 4, I'll be 75. So, all right, deal with it. Uh, but I, as I recall, I think it was my 70th birthday, and all the family gathered together. My son at that point was pastoring in the Marietta Church, uh, and uh, shortly after he got there, and left. Uh, I need to check with you on was that David's fault or was it yours? I don't know. But, but anyway, he was pastoring there in Marietta. My two oldest grandsons were students at Southern Adventist University. My daughter and son-in-law had come down to spend the weekend, celebrate the birthday, see the boys at the college. And we discovered that a very exciting thing was happening. Actually, this was Saturday night. My birthday was on Sunday. Very exciting thing. The Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, which is a great orchestra that I love to hear, was performing Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. Now, I don't know how many symphony lovers there are here, but anyone who is a symphony lover will know Tchaikovsky's Fifth has this phenomenal brass powerful ending to it that just brings the congregation, well, the congregation, that's uh, the audience. They're not congregations, you're congregation. Brings the audience right up out of their seats. So we were really excited about this possibility that the whole family was going to be there, and I bought tickets. This was my birthday present to, to everybody and to myself. Bought tickets for everybody, all of the children and the grandchildren, to go hear the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra perform Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. How many Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony lovers are there here? There's so few of us perfect people left. So we 
gathered together to do that. My son and daughter-in-law and the kids were coming down from their place north of town, and we were coming from the east side of town, about 10 miles away (coughs) where we were staying. And we jumped in my Pacifica, which is parked right outside here, by the way, in a first-time visitor spot. I just thought I'd mention that. (laughs) Jumped in the car, headed for Symphony Hall, downtown Atlanta. A strange thing happened. As I started out, I, you know, you recognize the noise that your car makes, don't you? You even know what the door of your car going shut sounds like. You know, they're just a kaboom, you know. You recognize that. We started out and something didn't sound right. As I was driving along, there was something going thwack, 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 thwack. And the, the way, and I'll give you a little bit of automotive insight right here. The way to know whether it's related to your tires and drive mechanism is if you take it out of gear and rev up the engine and the thwacka, thwacka, thwacka stays the same pace. If it's something wrong with your engine and you rev up the engine, then the thwacka, thwacka, thwacka goes faster, you see. So I just that's, that's a little freebie for you here today. So I took it out of gear and listened and it stayed the same. And I thought, well, that's, that's odd. I, I wonder what that is. And my daughter happened to hear it, too, and she was wondering about it. But we said, well, uh, we, we're going to get there about a half an hour early, so, you know, we'll just keep going. We'll worry about that later on. So about halfway downtown to Atlanta, going on, what was that highway, 400? 400 was the one that went in, I think. Going down Highway 400, a little light came on in my control panel that said one tire, low pressure. I thought, well, okay. Uh, We're still doing okay. As we started getting closer to downtown, the car began not to handle well. And I began to realize that something on the right rear of the car was not right. And there was one exit before the exit to the concert hall, and things were getting really bad and there was a Shell service station sign. I thought, oh, how wonderful. So I whipped off the exit, went over to the Shell station. Well, do you know what service station means these days? Gas for your car and food that will, well, we won't say that, but it'll do the same thing for you. That's it. Most of them don't even have restrooms anymore. No technicians, no help, no nothing, no tire changing, nothing. I pulled up by the air pressure gauge. You thought air was free? Uh, Try to get some for your car. Pulled up by the air pressure gauge and checked, and what I found out was that somewhere I had run over a roofing tack the kind that you use to nail the tar paper down on your roof. Uh, They're they're a big, long roofing tack, and then they have a plastic ring around them like that, which holds the tar paper down. Some of you have, I see nodding, you've put tar paper down. That that holds the tar paper? Well, one of those had gotten in my tire. Pulled it out. Well, the tire was flat anyway. So we thought, well, we can hurry uh, with two young college guys there and their dad and me. Uh, We can whip this out in a hurry. And we pulled out the tire jack, started jacking it up, and the jack malfunctioned. Nothing at the service station to help at all. So I said to my son-in-law, Bruce, I said, go into the service station, see if you can find a phone book and, and call a taxi and see if you can get everybody else to the concert on time. And I'll stay here and I'll call AAA and see if they will come. And this, is, by the way, is not a paid commercial for AAA. See if they will come and take care of this tire for me. Well, we had just had a horrific rainstorm in Atlanta earlier that day. And there was flash floods and problems 
wrecks, crashes, everything all over town. Bruce, trying to get a taxi, came back out and said, no, this hour of the night, taxis are not willing to come downtown Atlanta. No taxis. So I called AAA, and AAA said, well, we have accidents and crashes all over town. We don't know. It may be an hour or two before anybody can get there. So here we are, frustrated, trying to figure out what to do when about five minutes after I called, a AAA truck pulls in right beside us. One of them just happened to be going by on the freeway when the call came in, and the lady who was driving the truck pulled off, pulled up right beside us, said, can I help you? Now, I don't know exactly how to describe this lady to you. Um, she was, well, let's say it looked as if maybe she could go and pick up the back bumper of the car by herself while we changed the tire. I mean, this was one powerful woman. And she had all the right tools, and she whipped things out, and boom, and the power jack went up, and they, we'd already gotten the spare tire out. She took the tire off. We threw it in the back. She put the tire on, and in a matter of five minutes, we were ready to go. And, of course, this is not a commercial for AAA. I said, what do I owe you? No charge. Be on your way. We pulled up in front of the concert hall with about two minutes to spare. My son-in-law looked up and he said, there's the sign right there, valet parking, right in front of the door. We pulled up to the valet parking, jumped out of the car. The ushers were waiting at the door, showed us up the stairs. The doors closed behind us to begin the concert. We walked over to our seats and sat down and the lights of the house dimmed and the conductor came out for the concert. There we were. Spare tire. Spare tires used to be different things than they are now. Now, the first cars that I had, a spare tire was one exactly like the other four. But what you did was you rotated them in and out, and when you got one that was really worn out, you put it in the spare tire place, and you put the four good tires on your car. Because the one that was worn out, the, the old spare tire, that couldn't go very far or do very much, and was all bald, I mean, what can I say? Uh, how do you manage to keep all that hair, David? I don't know. It's, but the point of the spare tire is simply this. Why am I telling you this story? Because the point of a spare tire may not take you as far or as fast, particularly these little tricycle wheels that we have on spare tires now. But the point of spare tire time is during an interim to get you from point A point B. That's why we're here together. This is spare tire time. We probably won't be able to go as fast as we would at other times. We probably won't be able to go as far. But we're going to get together from point A to point B. So So God has arranged, and I think in an unusual way in the recent decades, for us to have spare tire time in churches, time for us to have an interim. And these are good things, good experiences. I've, I've done oh, almost a dozen of them now up and down the East Coast. Forest Lake Church twice, uh, Beltsville Church twice, uh, Collegedale Church, uh, two churches in Atlanta. And the beauty of that for me is now I have dear 
congregational friends all up and down the East Coast that I would not even have had the opportunity to be able to share time together with were it not for this unique experience. Chance for us to be able to share together what Christian church and fellowship is all about. Now, there are probably a lot of long-term ideas and projects that this church has in mind that I really won't be able to help you with because it's spare tire time. There may be some issues that come up during our time together that we will not be able to resolve in that period of time. But Gary, God has designed it such that we can have this interim, which you have graciously through the conference granted me the opportunity to share with these dear people, where we can do what it is that church is about. Now, there are images of the church in Scripture, two of them in particular. One of them speaks of the church as the bride, and that's a great one, too. I like that. But the one I want to talk to you about just a little bit today is the church as body. In fact, the church as body, the, the, well, the church as bride is a very delightful and thrilling and warming thing to experience. You know, wow, that, you know, that's such a great illustration. But you can't take it too far. The body illustration, you can really go places with that. It works. I've actually been reading through 1 Corinthians 12 looking for a place where it says spare tire, but I haven't found that. But we can understand as we look at it. 1 Corinthians 12, now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. Verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God who works in all of them. To each one is manifestation of the spirit is given to the common good. Here is a curious thing. A point that we often miss, and I'm going to talk about this in more depth later on if I'm here long enough to get to this sermon. But the interesting thing about the gifts of the Spirit is that they are not given to you. Whoa, what did he say? The gifts of the Spirit are not given to you. They are given to the church. And you are the vehicle through which they are given. Wow. Wow. That's a whole different story, isn't it? And if you fail to convey those gifts that God has given, then the church misses what he intended it to have. Gifts of the Spirit. Verse 7. Now each one of the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. The one is given the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by this one spirit, another miraculous powers, another prophecy, distinguish between spirits, speak in different tongues, still another is the interpretation. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. Verse 14, now the body is not made up of one part, but many. And now... Paul enters into a little bit of tongue-in-cheek. You know, we read the Bible far too seriously most of the time. We don't let it really say what it's saying. It's, It's a fun book. We'll talk some more about that, too. It's a fun book. Now, come on. If you're not reading this from the Bible, you'd snicker. Okay, here you go. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would, for not, not for that reason, be not part of the body. Now, come on, isn't that kind of funny? Well, maybe I need to read it again. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. Come on, snicker, snicker. That's funny stuff. And it's funny on purpose. 
And if the eye should say, because I am, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. Come on, make us little. This is tongue in cheek stuff. It's stating the ludicrous to explain the obvious. In fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Now, let me go one little bit further than the Apostle Paul. Let's just really put wheels on this thing and make it roll. Have you ever slammed your finger in a door? Oh, yeah. Oh, I suppose all of us have done that. Slammed your finger in a door. Curious thing that happens when you slam your finger in a door. The rest of the parts of the body say, You stupid finger, what were you doing in the way of the door? You knew that door was going to close. Why did you stay there? Is that what the body does? Let me tell you another story. It was not slamming a finger in the door. It was actually this thumb, this thumb right here, not slammed in a door. I was working in my yard, and I did what I have always told my kids and myself not to do. A very simple rule. Do not cut toward yourself with a knife. How smart is that? Do not cut toward yourself with a knife. And I had one of these little Stanley cut-off knives that, you know, you break off the end piece and you shove it out a little further. Uh, and that way it's always sharp until you've finally broken off all the little pieces and then you go get a new one. And I was cutting with my left hand, holding something in my right hand, uh, being an ambidextrous person, I never know exactly which hand I'm going to use for something. But anyway, I, was, uh, I remember what I was do doing that day. I was cutting something, carving on a piece of wood, and the chip broke off, and I brought that Stanley knife full force right in, right beside my thumbnail, and I cut a strip of flesh off clear back to my knuckle, and it was just hanging loose. And so my left hand said to my right hand, you stupid hand, why did you do that? We're going to punish you. What was the Apostle Paul saying about the body? That's not at all what happened. My left hand immediately went to my right hand and took hold of it and held that flap of flesh down tight so it could be saved for the body. Do you get what I'm saying? It could be saved for the body. It could become useful again when it was healed. And my feet went into action. I was down in my yard. We have about an acre and a half. I was down at the low point of the yard near the carriage house. My feet went into action, and I ran toward the house. My wife was not at home at the time, so I knew I had to take care of this myself. I... The voice, the voice of experience, that part was not funny. <laughs> My feet went into action, and I ran to the house. My head was having a little bit of problem. It was, you know, the kind of the lights were going out kind of thing, a little bit shocky. It wasn't doing its job real well. I ran into the house. 
grabbed some bindings and bandages and wrapped it around so that it would staunch the bleeding. Then with my other hand, I was able to open up fresher, cleaner things that were not so soiled with all the blood that was gushing from it. This is a nasty story, isn't it? (laughs) And my other hand carefully wrapped and bound that back together. It was two or three weeks later that my left hand was finally able to take the bandages off. Of course, it had been redressed. And by the way, my wife had helped out. She'd come home by that time. (laughs) Finally take them off. And do you know the interesting thing is today, if you look at this thumb, you can only very faintly see a slight trace of the scar. And unless I remember the story, it has no effect on me whatsoever. You are the body of Christ. What are we going to do together as the body of Christ in the next few weeks or months? We are going to help one another, strengthen one another. We are going to go out into the world that surrounds us and show what the body of Christ is like as it fellowships together, as it serves one another, as it reaches out and takes those who are wounded and hurting and binds them up and brings them back to full function in the body of Christ. It's spare tire time. And your spare tire is kind of old and bald. But we're going to get from point A to point B as the family of God, sharing one another's burdens, thrilling over one another's joys and demonstrating to the world that being part of the body of Christ is the place to be.